So for the last, ooh, well, okay, so we had a one-week hiatus from it uh, with last week. So we are in week four of our series on Ruth. We have been looking at this little book of the Bible that happens uh, just after the book of Judges in the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. As we are right there, we've been looking at this book of Ruth for the last few weeks, and I'm loving the book of Ruth because what it does is it gives us this understanding of God without being overt, without being blatant in its presentation. It shows us God through the lives of some, uh, some significant people. We just look at this story of Naomi and Ruth and Boaz, and we see God in the midst of it. And so this morning, what I want to talk about is I want to talk about decisions. Have any of you ever had to make a decision in your life? <laughs> okay? Ever had to make any sort of decisions? Okay? How many of you have had to make a significant life-altering decision? Well, only a couple of you. For the rest of you, man, I, I, you are blessed by, by having everything just kind of remain. Okay? Life-altering <laughs> decisions are those big moments when our lives take uh, a dramatic turn in another direction. If you didn't raise your hand but you've ever been married, that's a life-altering decision. <laughs> right? If you didn't uh, raise your hand but you've ever taken on a career, that is a life-altering decision. Bought a house, sold a house, moved locations. Those are life-altering decisions. And how do we cope with life-altering decisions? What do we do? Any of you made a life-altering decision on the spur of the moment, just a snap decision? Anyone? Okay. So I want you to share with me what that meant at some point. Because uh, life-altering decisions are things that we often take some time to examine. A good example of this is the way our church body, the LCMS, handles the process of the divine call. We call a pastor or a church worker. I love how this is structured because I actually receive direction for my call. Do you know that? I got the call, but there was also directions that went along with it, how I was supposed to approach it. And what they told me to do was discuss it with my pastor, talk with close counsel, family, friends, people who could give me some clarity. And you know what else I'm supposed to do? Pray about it. Right? Spend some time seeking God. This is how we are supposed to handle life-altering decisions. It used to drive me nuts when you ask someone and they'd say to you, well, let me pray about it. Because I didn't really understand. But I get it now. When they say, let me pray about it, what they are saying is, I want to seek God in the middle of my decisions. In fact, this is what Proverbs chapter 3 says. It says, uh, chapter 3, verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on what? Your own Lean not on your own understanding, but in all ways submit to him, submit to God, and he will make your paths straight. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. This is about bringing God into our decisions. And I think intuitively, maybe we understand this with the big decisions, but what about simple everyday things? You know? Are we seeking God just in the decisions that we make on a day-to-day -day basis? You know, do we get so caught up in the big stuff, in the, in the, you know, the theological questions or the, or the, uh, the life-altering ones that we forget about the mundane stuff? A number of years ago, I bought, which to me was, the, was only the second car I had purchased as a married person. And I discovered something. That is a life-altering decision, not just because I'm spending a lot of money on a car, but because I also have a wife. And if you don't tell her that you're buying the car... <laughs> And you surprise her with the car, it can go one of two ways. <laughs> Am I okay? But as I went to look at this car, I got so caught up in the extra features. You know, it had these cool lit rings around the cup holder so you could see them in the dark. Okay? The glove compartment, the air conditioning flowed into the glove compartment on purpose. Okay, on purpose, it flowed in there so you could keep things cold. And I was so caught up in the extra stuff, I completely forgot to look for cruise control. That's a basic yeah. thing. Are we seeking God in the simple questions? The truth is, God needs to be part of our decisions, no matter what they are. No matter what we're doing. Okay, maybe it's not, do I have potatoes or rice for dinner? I don't know if that's necessarily a God question. I mean, it could be. 
Uh, but he needs to be, there are decisions that we make every day that affect us, that affect other people, that affect our careers, our neighbors, our communities, and our nation. And are we bringing God into the decisions that we make? And what I have this morning out of Ruth, and we're going to be in Ruth chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, you want to open to Ruth chapter 3, pull out the church app, click on it, you're going to see, we're going to read the last couple of verses of Ruth 2, but then we're going to be in Ruth, two, Ruth 3. And what I have is four best practices, if you will. Okay? But I want to encourage you to consider when you have decisions to make. Now, these may not all apply or all apply all the time, but I think these steps, any steps we'll see in Ruth, I, I think as a general rule, they'll be broadly applicable to your life. So, while you're looking up Ruth chapter 3, just to recap real quick where we've been, Ruth started out with, uh, with a family. It started out with Elimelech and Naomi and their two sons. And famine occurs in Bethlehem, the land that they're living. They are Hebrews, Jewish people. They are followers of Yahweh, the one true God. They live in Bethlehem in the land of Judah. Famine strikes the land of Bethlehem, and so they leave, and they go to Moab. And this was a moment of rejection of faith in God, because Moab was a pagan land. It was not a place where good followers of God should be moving their families. And yet this is what they do. And they turn their backs on the God of their nation. They move to the land of Moab. And as so often happens when we turn our backs on God, disaster strikes. Elimelech does. The two sons take Moabite wives, which is another step in the wrong direction. Not supposed to marry outside of your nation and people. But they take Moabite wives. Then ten years pass, the two sons die. And Naomi is left on her own with her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. And so Naomi, at this point, realizes there's nothing left for her. She turns her back on Moab, and she goes back to Bethlehem. Now, they are two widows, one of them a foreigner, a stranger in a strange land, a woman who had no place in that community. And they are both without providers and protectors. And this puts them on the bottom rung of society. No one to care for them, no one to provide for them. Women in that time, they, they didn't have jobs. They didn't have careers. They didn't have any of the structures that we take for granted today. They needed their husbands to take care of them. And they were left without that. And so, taking advantage of a Hebrew law that allowed for the widow and the foreigner and the orphan, those who were poor, to find food to eat, Ruth goes to a field and she begins to glean. Gleaning is the process of collecting food from the fringes of the field where the harvesters are instructed. They're instructed to leave that behind. Anything they drop, anything on the fringes, they leave that behind. And she meets Boaz. And Boaz is life-changing for Ruth and Naomi. And this is where we are. Ruth has returned from gleaning in Boaz's field. He's one of their close kinsmen. And we get to Ruth chapter 2, verse 20. She has come back to Naomi, and she is telling Naomi how the day has gone. Naomi opens the question with basically, hey, Ruth, how was your day? And Ruth responds and tells her everything that's happened. And Naomi says, the Lord bless him. Ruth chapter 2, verse 20. The Lord bless him, Boaz. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, he has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, the man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. And if you're taking notes this morning, you haven't written that down, write down guardian redeemer. We're going to be talking about that over the next couple of weeks. We'll talk about it a little today. Guardian redeemer or kinsman redeemer is a very significant role in the book of Ruth. Then Ruth the Moab, and, and really it speaks to the relationship that happens between Ruth and Boaz and Naomi in the picture. Then Ruth the Moabite, Note that it identifies her that way. Once again, we are reminded that Ruth is not of this land. She is not of this place. She is a foreigner, a stranger. She does not belong among these people. And the writer of Ruth reminds us of that fact because it, it's significant that she is the main player in the story. Ruth the Moabite said, he said to me, stay with my workers until I finish harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him, because in someone else's field, you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvest were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. So what's going on? What we see by the end of chapter 2 is we see a radical change in attitude. Do you remember how Naomi was when she got back to Bethlehem? 
Right? The people come out and they say, oh, look, it's Naomi. And Naomi said what? She says, don't call me Naomi. Call me what? Anybody remember? Call me Mar, which means bitter. Naomi means pleasant. I am not pleasant. I am bitter. My life has been emptied out. I went to Moab full. I have returned empty. God has turned me upside down, shaken everything out from inside of me, and I am left with nothing. And yet by this moment, we see Naomi's, uh, Naomi's attitude is in changing. It's improving. She sees light and hope. Boaz has been kind to Ruth. And because of that, it's kindness then to Naomi. Boaz has provided for her. Way beyond the bare requirements of the law. You know, he takes it, he goes, this is the bare minimum. I'm going to go above and beyond. He has protected her by inviting her to stay in his field, not go to another one. He has made her part of his family. Sit down, eat with me, eat with my harvesters and my people. And so Naomi who had been upset and angry with God, instead turns and pours God's blessing out upon Boaz. And now the focus of Ruth begins to change. Up until now, they had been worried about their survival. Now they begin to look to the future. You remember the question that I say we should always ask when we read scripture? Who remembers? What does this say about Jesus? Thank you. Who said that? Where are you? What does this say about Jesus? Whenever we read the Bible, we want to ask the question, what does this say about Jesus? Because everything we read points to Jesus. And what we see throughout Ruth so far is that God's hand has been evident in each and every circumstance. Ruth goes to the one field of the one man who can take care of her in this time and in this place. She finds welcome. She finds provision. She finds security. Or what does it say about Jesus? We are seeing it. Because in the person of Boaz, we see the person of Jesus. Because Jesus is the only one who can provide for us exactly what we need. And I'm not talking about just in our routine daily lives, but he provides for our eternity. He provides for us. He protects us. He welcomes us. And we don't find any of it by accident. Jesus is the one who can do for us what no one else can. Boaz is a living proclamation of the gospel some 600 years before Christ. And so, in chapter 3, the story changes from survival to the plans for the future. Ruth chapter 3, verse 1. One day, Ruth's mother-in-law, one day, so time has passed. Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Now Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, get dressed in your best clothes, then go down to the threshing floor. But don't let him know that you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying, then go, uncover his feet, and lie down. And he will tell you what to do. And I'll do whatever you say to your best. So we just moved from a story of trouble and hardship to a romance novel. <laughs> right? I mean, it seems like the shift, right? It's a little risque. But this actually leads us to our first best, best practice because what Naomi is doing is she is preparing for decision making. And the first one is contextualize the decision. This is about placing the decision or the questions that you're asking in context, understanding them in the circumstances that they are in. Way back in our first week on Ruth, I mentioned some themes that run through the book of Ruth, and we're beginning to see them played out now. It's okay if you don't remember them, but if you'd like to jot them down, here they are again, because we're seeing it happen right now. We're seeing things move from barrenness to fruitfulness. Okay, We're seeing it move from emptiness to fullness. In Naomi directly, we see it move from bitterness to pleasantness, and hunger to plenty. It's starting to play out. Naomi has moved from that place, from one to the other. And so what she's doing is she's no longer focusing on what she's lost, but she's looking at what's ahead. And as she rolls out her plan, she contextualizes the decision. She looks around, she sizes up the situation, she makes an attempt to understand the circumstances, she figures out what's going on. She has begun to investigate and ask questions. 
so she can make good decisions. This is one of the things I think we sometimes fail to do. We fail to understand the decision that we have to make in the context of its setting. Maybe we don't ask questions to understand what's going on. We live in an era of snap judgments, don't we? You know, a time of sound bites and media headlines and personal opinions. Are we taking that time to understand before we decide? This is what Naomi is doing. She's not making a snap decision. It says one day, time has passed. How many of you have read Ruth before? Okay. Are you you're familiar with the story then? Have you ever stopped to wonder how Naomi knew that Boaz was going to be at the threshing floor? There's no indication she had any interaction with him. I mean, she was surprised when Ruth came home and said, this is the field where I was at. She's like, man, that was great. I didn't send you out looking for Boaz. I didn't tell you about him beforehand. You ended up there. Now she knows that Boaz is going to be at the threshing floor. It's because she is trying to make the best decision she can by gathering the information, by understanding the context. She is active in the process. Often we take faith to be a sit back and let God do his thing sort of relationship. But I think, really the Bible I think bears this out, God wants us to be active in the process. It doesn't say sit back and you will find. What's it say? It says seek and you will find, right? Jesus, Jesus is asked, where are you going? And he doesn't say, let me tell you. He says, come in and see. You're active in the process. Faith is active. So Ruth chapter 3, verse 6. So she, Ruth, went down to the threshing floor, did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth appeared quietly, approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled, uh, something startled the man, and he turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. <laughs> Who are you? He asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. There's that phrase again. And so what happens here is Ruth's actions takes us to our next decision-making practice, which is once you contextualize the situation, you need to move forward in faith. Once all the info is gathered, once the decision presents itself, you've got to move forward and play faith. And this is another place where we get stuck. When facing a big decision, we plan and we plan and we research and we investigate and we never actually move forward. We can actually plan ourselves right how to follow in God's direction. But what Ruth does is she moves forward in faith. She doesn't know how this is going to play out. She doesn't know what's going to happen. But she steps out. She trusts Naomi, and Naomi is following God. God has a plan for Ruth. What would have happened if she had decided to remain at home rather than going to glean? If she had just hoped that God would drop into her lap what she needed? So what Naomi decides, Ruth does. And this whole nighttime rendezvous thing, it seems a little risque. Get washed. Put on perfume. Put on your fancy dress. Seems like she's going to seduce Boaz. But take a moment. Stick your finger in there. Flip over two books to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel. Uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, we've got a story with David. 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 20, it says, Then David got up from the ground. Now let me set the stage. What's happened here is David has been fasting and praying because his son is dying. This is the son of him and Bathsheba. And his son is dying. And so he is fasting and he is praying. And he reaches a point where his son passes on. And so this is where we pick it up. Then David got up from the ground and after he had washed, put on lotions, changed his clothes. Sound familiar? He went into the house of the Lord and he worshipped. Then he went to his own house and at his request they served him food and he ate. He breaks his fast. His attendants asked him, why are you acting this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. But now that the child is dead, you get up and eat. And he answered, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows, the Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. 
So while David's son was dying, he fasted, he prayed, but when the moment came when the fasting and the praying wouldn't, didn't have a chance of doing any more, he gets up. He gets cleaned up. Changes his clothes, and he goes and he worships God. This is almost the exact same language that Naomi uses with Ruth. And what David is saying is it's time to move forward. I want to bring a clarification. This is moving forward. This is not moving on. Anyone who has ever experienced the loss of a loved one, you know that you don't move on. That remains with you in some form for the rest of your life. But at some point, you move forward. David says it's time to move forward. So he gets up and he gets cleaned up. Naomi is telling Ruth, she says, you know what? Bad stuff has happened. We have experienced hardship and pain. But it's time to move forward forward. God has refilled Naomi. She's gone from bitter to rejoicing. This is true for each of us as well. Eventually, we have to move forward in faith. I don't know what you're growing through today. <clears throat> I don't know what difficulties you face. Maybe you're hurting or mourning. Maybe you're afraid. Maybe, and this is where I am, maybe you're just plain exhausted. But what God is telling each of us is that at some point we've got to step forward just like for Ruth. We need to step forward in faith and trust that God has a plan and that he is leading us somewhere. And so Ruth gets cleaned up. She gets dressed. She goes to sleep at Boaz's feet and she waits to see how he responds. Verse 10, the Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you what all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Ruth the Moabite, but known as a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am a guardian, a guardian and redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night and in the morning. If he wants to do his duty as your guardian and redeemer, good, let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said, no one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, bring me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and placed the bundle on her. Then he went back to town. And Boaz's response to Ruth's Actions takes us to our third decision-making practice. And I want you to notice something about Boaz. He could have taken advantage of the situation. But instead, and this is number three, adapt your plans with integrity. Boaz didn't know that when he woke up in the middle of the night, there was going to be a woman sleeping at his feet. Okay? And yet when she did, he had a number of courses of action that he could take. He could have taken certainly taken advantage of the situation in the moment. He didn't. He could have taken advantage of the offer that she was making. She came to him to ask him to marry her. That's what she's doing. She's asking him to fulfill his role as guardian redeemer. And this was a role that came out in Leverite law. It affected Hebrew culture some. This is one of the few places we see it pop up in the Old Testament. Really the most obvious place where it's described most clearly. But this role basically says that when your husband dies and you are without children, an unmarried member of your husband's family has an obligation to marry you and produce children for your dead husband's line so his name will remain, not die out. If Boaz is to marry Ruth, this child will actually become Naomi's. In name, at least, to carry on Elimelech's line. But what Boaz says, I mean, he says, look, clearly she must be a looker. She's not running around after uh, younger men. She goes to Boaz. And Boaz is like, he couldn't marry her. Nobody else was looking. Time has passed. Nobody was looking to step into Ruth's life in this way. And yet, what does Boaz do? He says, there is another one who is closer related than I am, who is first in line to fulfill the role of guardian and redeemer. And so he adapts his plans. When he went to bed, he wasn't expecting the situation, but he adjusted to the moment, and he does it with integrity. Integrity is about making the right choice. 
Not the one that serves us necessarily the best, but instead the one that is right. Boaz is impressed with the way that she has come to him. And yet, he doesn't make the choice that will serve him in the most desirable way, but instead he makes the best choice. Integrity is about standing by our word. It's about doing what we say we will do. We wouldn't need oaths if we actually followed scripture and let our yes be yes and our no be no, right? Right? There isn't a lot of integrity that seems visible in our world today. Everyone looking for advantage. Everyone seems willing to do what's best for themselves. Boaz doesn't do what's best for him. He says there is another. But if he doesn't, then I will. And that's one more piece to Boaz's integrity. To his character. To his person. Last couple of verses. Ruth chapter 3, verse 16. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, so she's gone home from the threshing floor, Naomi asked, how to go? And then she told her everything Boaz had done for her, and he had, and she added, he gave me these six measures of barley, saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. And then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. So as Ruth is getting ready to leave the threshing floor, Boaz says, hold out your shawl. He pours in six measures of barley. This is Boaz's commitment. It's a sign of Boaz's commitment. But he tells her to take it where? This, he doesn't say, here's barley so that you can eat. What's he say? Take it to Naomi, because it's a sign of his commitment to Ruth, but also to the commitment that he is making as guardian and redeemer to Naomi. And so Ruth brings it back. Naomi recognizes it for what it is, and now she and Ruth have done all they can. Now is the time to wait. It's time to wait for Boaz to act. It's time to wait for God to move. She has turned it all over to him. And this is the final practice. After we have contextualized the decision, after we have moved forward in faith, after we have adapted our plans with integrity, we need to leave space for God. We've got to leave space for God to work. And this is probably the toughest step in all of these because when we leave space for God, what do we have to do? Wait. We have to relinquish control of our plans. Everything is going according to plan, but Naomi says, wait. Why? Because she's leaving space for God to work. Psalm 34, verse 8. Taste and see the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Check out the Lord. See that he is good. See that he has good plans. See that he is working for the good of your life. Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 to 6. I thank my, this is Paul speaking. I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Who begins the good work? God does. Who begins the good work? God does. Who carries it on to completion? God does. We've got to leave space for God. We've got to give him a chance to do what only he can do. We think we know what's going on. We think we've got it all figured out. We think we have all the plans in order. But there is a really good chance that we might have it wrong. There's a really good chance that maybe we don't understand everything. There's a really good chance that God may have a modification to the plans that we put together. Maybe you're wondering, where do I go next? You know, what's, going, what's going to happen? I'm frustrated. I'm exhausted. When's it going to end? I don't know what to do. Here's my suggestion. Ready for this? Bring it before God. Bring it to God. Ask God. Him. Don't try to make the decision to get. This is what Elimelech did right in the beginning. He tried to solve their problem by leaving Bethlehem rather than seeking God in the land that God had given to them. God has placed every one of us where we are for a reason. He may call us to different places, but I'm assuming that you are here today because this is where God has called you to be, to Ridgefield, Clark County, this area. And what is our calling? To be the presence of God in our neighborhoods where we are. <laughs> you want to know what's next? Ask God. 
Bring your questions to Him. In all of these practices, God is at work. Are we bringing our decisions, are we bringing our questions before Him? The psalmist writes, taste and see that the Lord is good. And then listen. What is God saying? What is God saying to you today? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I just give thanks for the way that you are working in our lives, for the way that your providence orchestrates our steps, that you make opportunities and chances present themselves before us, and all you ask is for us to grab hold. All you ask is for us to follow where you are leading. Fill us with your Holy Spirit this morning, Lord. Help us to see the answers to the questions that we have. Help us to see how you are moving and you are working in our lives each and every day. As we step out of this place today, Lord, we go out to be your mission, your presence in the world in which we live, Lord. May the light of Christ shine from within each and every one of us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray and all God's children said, Amen. Amen.